Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Ward 4 meeting. This is our third Ward 4 meeting of 2018. My name is Susan DeCastro. I am the Ward 4 City Councilor. This is my ninth month in this job. I feel like I'm giving birth to myself. This has been such uh, an interesting nine months. I've learned so much about the city and about our Ward 4 residents. I'm delighted that you're all here tonight. Thank you so much. And I also welcome our viewing audience who will be seeing this thereafter. Thanks for being here to tape it, Aaron. Um, what do I want to say to you? I'm trying hard to make Ward 4 better for all of our residents. And so some of the issues that I've been working on since our June meeting, I've worked on potholes and street lights. I've acted as a go-between between, between our residents and City Hall and sometimes between neighbors. I've worked on trash and recycling and street issues, hello, and crime issues and noise. Everybody knows I've been working on noise. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure you're all aware, but the city council is comprised of 11 elected members. We have one from each of the seven wards of the city of Brockton, and we have four who are at large um, councilors, and they are elected from the entire city. Um, and the city council meets four times each month, except in July and August. We meet twice as the city council, and then we meet two other times as the finance committee. And what generally happens is we take in, in issues and papers in as the city council, we refer them to the finance committee or the several subcommittees that we sit on, which include, we have subcommittees for real estate, for accounts, for public safety. What else do we have? Accounts, public safety, real estate. I said that. Ordinance. Ordinance, that's right. And we will be talking a bit about our ordinance committee is very busy at this time of year, working on a new ordinance addressing um, the, the state law uh, approving recreational marijuanas, growth distribution and retail sale. So we are very busy. We meet um, as our subcommittees in addition to as the finance committee and the city council. This is a part-time job. I'm paid $15,000 a year for it, plus I get some expense money. It, it's easily the busiest part-time job I've ever had in my life. It truly it is. This is truly public service. And I'm really happy to do it, except every so often I wake up in the morning and go, what did I get myself into? <laughs> this is just, um, it seems like the issues that have come up in front of the city council since I was sworn in in January, so many of them have been hard and complicated. and. Um, that's just how it goes, it's just how it goes. So this evening we have only one speaker and a very fine speaker at that. Lieutenant Richard Linehan is with the Brockton Police Department. He is going to speak to you about his life's passion, which is the work he does with the homeless and with the addicted. I'm going to turn the microphone over to him. I don't really like these mics. You sure my loud voice wouldn't be better? <laughs> yeah, the mic, the mic is actually getting the sound from there, so sorry. So I got to keep Say it? Yeah, please. Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay, I'll keep it. My name's Dick Lenahan. I've been with Brockton Police for 33 years. I'm in charge of the community education unit. Within that unit, there's a lot of uh, fractions, and I'm going to go through each one of them. It's going to take a little bit. And there goes the mic. Crime Watch. You involve a crime watch here? Bill Haley come down to speak to anybody? No. If you want to start a crime watch, please reach out to Bill Haley, yeah, Officer Big Bill Haley. Yeah, do. You do have a crime watch. No, we want to stop him. We need one. Officer William Haley, W. Haley at BrocktonPolice.com, and he'll come right down and help you assist that with starting that crime watch. Juvenile education, we take care of that in our schools, and that's growing. Domestic violence, I oversee the domestic violence unit. To include two officers that reach out to the community in the um, Cape Verdean community, community and the Haitian community. Good things with that, education for everybody. We talk about our laws here, culture that they bring, how we adapt them both together, and help anybody that needs help with that. The, the two officers that I have with that are outstanding. It's Officer Fonts and Officer Polonese. 
stress officer for the Brockton Police, not only the stress officer of Brockton Police, but for Plymouth County to include Boston. That's a good thing. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. I'll come back to that. Crisis intervention coordinator. In our department, we have a, approximately 75 officers that are trained in crisis intervention and the crisis intervention team. What is that? Somebody that ha sends in a call to the police department where there may be a crisis and the crisis is a mental health issue, we want an officer involved in that call that's been trained in, in crisis intervention. That is life-saving not only to, only to the client that they go out to deal with, but to the officer that's responding to that call of somebody that's suffering with a mental illness. Now, a mental illness, we're trying to take the stigma away. Think of somebody that has diabetes that's insulin dependent. What must they take? Insulin, so it's the medication. Who must they see to get that insulin? That insulin? A doctor. Medication, doctor. And who helps them keep their blood sugar in a normal range by the food that they take? A nutritionist. Similar to a therapist. Someone that has cardiac disease. What do they have to take? Nitro. Medication. Who do they have to see to get the medication? Okay. Doctor. Who helps them in their daily life and the activities that they can take place with? Physical therapist. Now let's talk. Rehab. What's that? Cardiac rehab. Cardiac rehab. Someone that's suffering with a mental illness. One of the treatments is what? Medication. medication. Who prescribes the medication? Doctor. Psychiatrist. Who do they speak to that becomes their friend and helps them through everything? A case manager or a counselor. The counsel is the ace. You can take cardiac disease and diabetes, put them together, mental illness is above them. And that's for the nation. So yes, it's good if we have a crisis intervention team member responding to that house to help someone that's suffering with a mental illness. <clears throat> Jail Diversion Program. Our Jail Diversion Program is myself, and I pretty much go out like I'm dressed here, and a clinician, Ashley. Constant, same cop, same clinician, knocking on the doors. It used to be a co-responder, and we'd do it during the shift, and you, we'd get the clinician from four to eight hours a week, and wait in the cruiser for a crisis to come in. We weren't producing that much. That four hour block, it was a hit or miss. So I said, well, we're gonna stop the co-responder. We're gonna give seven to 10 days after the crisis. Why? The co-responder, her and the cruiser with me in uniform driving to a crisis call, one of three things took place. Either the call didn't come in the right way, wasn't articulated well, wasn't a crisis at all. It was a true crisis. Where is somebody in true crisis gonna go? To the hospital? They're going to go to the hospital. Is that a positive experience? No. Why? You're going to be there for a long time. Third, it could be a crisis, but there was laws that were broke and were mandated to lock up on domestic violence. Where are they going? Is that a positive experience? No. So we revamped it. We go seven to ten days after the crisis. We walk up to the door cold. Knock on the door, the door opens up. Ashley introduces herself as the clinician that worked with the police department. This is Lieutenant Lenahan. I put my hands like this, not up, I put my hands like this. I tell him, you're not in trouble. We're here just following up. The police department doesn't even know we're here. So it's all confidential. We're welcomed into the house. Ashley will work with the family and she will get them plugged into services that fit the individual because the treatment can be different for everybody. If the first fit doesn't work, she'll find a second or a third or a fourth. Not once, not once have we been not allowed into the house and prior to leaving, I never knew the Brockton police cared so much. Thank you for coming. The next time the police, any police officer responds to that house for a crisis, are they going to be met with open arms or are they going to be 
they'll be welcomed. Yep. Yeah. Or they're going to be put off. They'll be welcomed. That decreases. It de-escalates that call once the police officers get there. If it's a negative experience, it will increase it. What do we have in the past? Respond to the call, lock up, hospital, wait for the next call to the house. The follow-ups. It can be weekly, bi-monthly, monthly, quarterly, half a year, out to a year. Wrap around, make sure that everybody's doing well. And they have the number they can call Ashley and we'll be going to that house the following week. Jail diversion program. Outstanding program. Outstanding program. Child witness to violence. Similar. Myself, Ashley. A child that witnesses or experiences violence. We want to go out. We want to touch that family. We want to talk to the child, make sure that the child is in the services that it needs, if it needs any services. Does the family also need help with services to pick that family back up? The violence could be, I don't want to name any, any type of cases here. It could be that the child witnessed a, a bad accident. It doesn't always have to be a, um, a crime in the house or abuse. It could be that they just witnessed a bad accident. It could be that they're being bullied in school and we learned about it. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Any type of violence that they witnessed or they were part of, they'll get a knock on the door with a clinician. That's the child witness the violence. While I'm talking about the child witness the violence, we used to have a red envelope program. Do, do you remember the red envelope? The red envelope was if a child experienced some type of violence the night before, that the school would get a call from an officer saying, Johnny experienced some violence the night before, and his behavior might be a little different today. So if Johnny didn't come in with his homework, he wasn't punished for not having it. If Johnny put his head down on the table and he took a nap, he wasn't punished for taking that nap after being up all night with the violence that he might have seen. Can you think of how that would compound with the child? He would think that the whole world is against them, not only at home or whatever the situation was, but also now the teachers are coming down on me. Well, there was a bump in the road somewhere in Massachusetts where somebody assumed that it was a domestic violence thing the child was involved with. Domestic violence that takes place in the home is nothing that can be shared. That, that has become sacred because it's an allegation at that point. That has become sacred just it's similar to a sexual crime that took place, the allegation of a sex crime. We tell nobody and we don't talk about it. It's handled in the courts. That assumption by the teacher that spread through the school took the program away from the state. So what did we do? We didn't want to lose it. So we reversed the flow. We asked the schools if Johnny's behavior changes drastically, you see it, drastic change, please reach out to the parents and have the parents sign a release that our team can go out and knock on that door because it's not a police-generated generated call. Police-generated, we can walk right through the door. Good news, handle with care. This came out of Virginia, but they modeled after our red envelope. Handle with care, the program's starting up back up again. If the child witnesses any type of violence, the phone call is made to the principal. The principal highlights with the teachers if there's a change in his behavior, they go see the adjustment counselor and hopefully they'll get the treatment that they need. Like Great stuff. <clears throat> Operation Divinity. Operation Divinity is not a constant cop. It's not a constant social worker, but it is a constant clergyman. Now that unit goes out for behavior issues. A stubborn child, uh, no boundaries, disrespectful to mom and dad, and the faith-based on that team is the one that will encompass the child and the family. And if he's not the fit, if he doesn't have the programs that he can offer, he'll reach out to another clergyman. Families that are open to it, it works. Families that are not open to it, we thank them for letting us visit their home. But the doors are always open. <clears throat> Citizen X. The Citizen X program I call them God's special children, because they really are. If you take the time to hear somebody's story and you actively listen to them, they'll tell you amazing things. We all are one really misfortune for being homeless. We're on the edge. 
one moment, one misfortune, we could be homeless. Citizen X is for the homeless that are in the, in the city uh, that have zero, zero family support. Zero. So who supports them? The police department, the fire department, Brewster Ambulance, our two hospitals, Mainspring, Neighborhood Health Clinic, and then we have a bunch of providers that come in, come to the table when we welcome them in. And we try to find services for them, uh, get folks involved with insurance, uh, GED, whatever that might be. And at times we have to Section 35. And what is the Section 35? It's a commitment for someone to go into treatment. Now that's only used when the situation gets drastic. What do I mean by drastic? Someone that overdoses, today's Wednesday, Monday, they overdosed at 7 p.m. They went to the hospital, they released at 2 a.m. Tuesday, they overdosed at 7 a.m. They released at the hospital at 2 a.m. Wednesday, they overdosed at 7. They'll be released at 2 a.m. Well, that person will now will try to encompass them with the records from the hospital and the trips from the ambulance sheets and the police involvement and the fire department involvement and we'll go to the court and we'll petition for a section 35 to get them into treatment. If they're not truly ready for treatment, it keeps them safe for a period of time and then they might go right back to the same behavior and we'll be there to catch them again. There are folks out there that are suffering from a substance use disorder and we'll just say alcohol right now that with Section 35 many times, and at some point it's gonna to be too many times. But who makes that decision? That rests on the judges. On the judges, they'll, they'll say, we've done him uh, eight times this month. He's just not ready. And that's, that's how many times do you go to the well? As many times as we can get him there. That's the Citizen X program, caring for the people that have no supports. I'm also the liaison for drug court. Drug court is outstanding. Drug court, I've been with the infancy with it. Drug court is reuniting children, I'll be on the child, to their parents. Participants with their children, it's reuniting them. To get into drug court, you have to have 18 months over your head in the House of Correction. You petition to get into drug court, it's reviewed with the social work and probation department and the judges. Once you're accepted, it's an 18-month commitment. And I'm trying to think, I think we only have one person that's going to do it within the 18 months. Because on that road to recovery, there is bumps and there's relapses, but they go back to the, to the phase that they were in just prior to it. So some have been for three years. But they are getting the supports that they need underneath them. And we just graduated five, I think it was two weeks ago, five participants. 18-month commitment. And then they're not forgotten this. We still reach out to them. 35 we talked about. Plymouth County Outreach. This is huge. <clears throat> this is extremely helpful. This, um, it's part of the healing. Plymouth County Outreach. The 27 communities in Plymouth County, us being the only city, and Bridgewater State. If somebody overdoses in our city, by the way, the percentage, what do you think it is? Yeah. Out of everyone that overdoses in our city, how many live here, percentage-wise? 50, yep, 50, 49, 51, 50, 50, 48, 52. We're at the 50, 50 mark. This Plymouth County outreach, person overdoses, transported to the hospital, MIU, uh, MOUs with the hospital, Arch is going to go, if they want it, Arch, Arch is a great great deal here. They'll come out and they'll speak to the client while they're in the ER, if they're willing, and try to get them into treatment. The hospital sends out to the Plymouth County Outreach computer the address, the person, how, many, how much Narcan it took to reverse the, um, their overdose, and if a follow-up's needed. So if 50% of the participants are out of town, we don't follow up with them. If they overdose in Brockton, they live in the city, there'll be a knock on their door with a police officer dressed in plain clothes, that's Officer McMillan, and an arch peer support. 
to invite them into treatment and also speak to the family. Do you think the family needs support? Yeah. Do you think the family needs help navigating yeah. them, their family member into treatment? It's a very murky, murky bay to get through without knowing. The other 50% notifications go out to those towns and they're knocking on the door the next day. If someone from Brockton overdoses in Hanson, we get notified of it and the door will be knocked on in Brockton. I think our percentage is about 80% engagement rate right now with either a family member or the substance person suffering from substance use disorder. Narcan. Narcan, we picked up Narcan. It was shortly after the mayor came in and Chief Hayden, who I was very skeptical about. I'm like, we never had a chief in my career, we never had a chief come from the outside. And I'm like, he's, I don't know, we've never had this before. This is uncharted territory here. Well, I just happened to be teaching a class and I come out and I run right into him, I was face to face. And he goes, and not too many people call me Dickie. <laughs> he was old enough to call me that. He goes, Dickie, what are we gonna do with this opiate crisis? I said, we need Narcan. Narcan, what is it? It reverses the opiate. How do you spell that? So I spelled it for him. He goes, well, what do you need? I said, we need about $14,000 to buy the product. This is before the state was giving it to us. And we gotta train everybody. And he said, do it. And I left him in the hallway, went to the training lieutenant, and I said, put this out to everybody. Stop the training. We're gonna get everybody trained in Narcan. That was huge because there was administrations before that and it, it, made, it was just that there was no clarity there, that they were more concerned about, will this be a liability on us if we start doing a medical procedure? Well, we, we saw what happened with that. Almost every officer in the Commonwealth carries Narcan now, which is a great thing. It's more about education, educating one another. Narcan's been around for a long time. Before I went into the police force, I used to work at the hospital. In the early 80s, we were given Narcan, but it was intravenously. So it's been around for a long time. Our saves with it, the numbers just keep growing. We are saving lives with it. How many times do you administer Narcan to somebody? As many times as you need to. Just last week, two officers came up to me and they, they went to the flag. There must be a flag in here somewhere. There's not. We need a flag in this room. They came to me and they said, Lieutenant, to the person, they were laying on the ground and they were as blue as the flag. And we gave them four, four um, milligrams of Narcan, rescue breathing, get, three minutes later, gave them another four. They started spontaneous breathing. Before they left, they were sitting up talking to the officers. That person, they were past death's door. I mean, that being that blue. And they were brought back. Huge. And the cops buy in. Why do the cops buy into it? Before, that, it was all about liability and we shouldn't be doctors and this really isn't our field. Who better? We're in the cruises. We're responding there rapidly. We're there before the fire department or the ambulance is. And it's a simple procedure. And there's no side effects to it. Either you're on the opiate and it's going to work or you're not on an opiate and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> the other buy-in is, and I challenge anybody in this room, who doesn't know someone close to them that has a substance use disorder? And how many times would you want them to get Narcan when they overdosed? I'm sure the answer is every time. Champion Plan. The Champion Plan, if you haven't heard of it, started February 29th, 2016. What is the Champion Plan? A person that's suffering from a substance use disorder in their moment of clarity, with a lot of fortitude, can walk across this threshold at Brockton PD and say, I want help. If you told me 33 years ago this was gonna be taking place, I'd be like, N not a chance. But the intake, police drug assistance, assistance, the intake is done at the police department. As of last Monday, 1,019 people, not 1,019 intakes, I like using the intake number, have crossed the threshold of Brockton PD and were accepted into the program. That's an 18-month wraparound. From our police department, if they have a warrant, they get checked for a warrant. If they have a warrant, they get locked up. Is that a bad thing? No, no not really. Not a bad thing. They get locked up on the warrant. As to date, 
and they go to court and they tell the judge, I want to join the champion program. Drug court's on board. The two, uh, Judge Bernard and Judge Valtali extend their date, release them, they come back and join the champion plan. So the warrants, we've had no bump. If it's a domestic violence warrant uh, or a violent warrant, sure, they're gonna be held, but we haven't, we haven't gone there yet. So we're doing well. So if they clear the warrants, now they're gonna get a Corey check. On the Corey check, if they're guilty of distributing drugs, guilty, and have two other drug-related crimes, they're not accepted into the program, but they're given the packet, and they have to make their own phone calls. That's just keep it, trying to keep the dealer with two other drug convictions, not out of the program, but they can make their own phone calls into the program. Three, four, five, six, endless numbers of drug convictions, personal use, they're welcome into the program. Crimes that supported their substance use disorder, they're welcomed into the program. Distributing, selling, being the dealer, and two other convictions, we had to draw the line somewhere. That's where we stop, but we give them the packet with all the numbers and they can make their own phone calls. Then they're asked to consent to a search because we're gonna see if they have any weapons because the next stage is the Gandara Center is gonna send over a peer or two and they're gonna walk the party back to the Gandara Center. Once they get back to the Gandara Center, they work with the, um, substance, the person suffering with substance use disorder and they get them into a program anywhere in Massachusetts. So they have a lot of beds that they can get. The average wait for a bed is an hour. Hospitals can't even do that. It's all about the network that you have. Yeah. Now how do they get there? Partnering with Brewster Ambulance? Zero dollars. They'll take them anywhere in Massachusetts. They're an 18 month commitment. They're making phone calls. They're doing wraparound with the client. I could tell you endless stories, but I think it would start exposing who the people were. But I can tell you this, graduates of the program are now opening sober houses. That's huge. Mental health first aid, getting back to the mental health side. Brockton PD every year, <clears throat> and this is under the jail diversion grant, officers are trained in mental health. Class size is about 12. Um, and what is it? It's a nine hour class talking about the signs and symptoms of mental health. By the end of the class, hands are going up and they used to say, what about me? What about all the trauma I see? What about the things that I experience? Where do I reach out for help? Well, mental health first aid, which is not statewide, it's not nationwide, it's worldwide, it started in Australia in 2001, came to the United States in 2008. They took that piece, they took that feedback that they were getting, and the first, um, the first quarter of the class, 25% of it is all about the first responder responding to calls and seeing trauma and how to deal with that, how to keep themselves well, and who to reach out to for help when they need it. What am I talking about? On any any given tour of duty, these, this could take place. An officer could respond to a SIDS death. Is that traumatic? To the family, to the officer, who has to explain to the family that the baby's gone. In that same day, they could respond to a car accident where a teenager expired in the accident. Are we on board? Are we in agreement with that? Yeah. And at the end of the shift, they could go to a hospice death. Family panics. They call the police, we zip there, hospice uh, personnel are there and they're saying, it's a hospice case. There's really nothing further for us to do there, but is that traumatic to the officer? And now they go home. And their loved one says, how was your day, dear? And what does the officer respond with? Fine. Anything but fine. Anything but fine, but in his own mind, he's going to deal with it. Cumulative stress, 
the, there's going to be a breaking point at some point. The mental for, health first aid helps the officer understand that, and it will, it will keep them more resilient. If they need somebody, the, stre the stress officer, they can reach out the crisis intervention stress management team, which Plymouth does have. Each county has their own team. Uh, if there is a traumatic event, they get called out to the scene. They do a defusion with the officers afterwards, which is important, afterwards. And then there's a debriefing days later, and then there's also further um, supports that are put in place if they so choose to get it. That's life-saving to who? Everybody. Everybody. If the officer starts losing confidence in themselves and they have children, what happens to the children? They start losing confidence also. So we're taking care of our own. Mental health awareness, NAMI, Department of Mental Health, the Municipal Police Training Council, we all sat down at a round, a round table and we hammered out a course on mental health awareness that every officer in Massachusetts had to take. Three hour block for a veteran, 12-hour block for new recruits. The recruits get it in the academy, 12-hour block. Similar to CIT, Crisis Intervention Team, Mental Health First Aid, Mental Health Awareness. The state's on board, and they're doing well with it. Needles, I gotta talk about needles, because Channel 25, <laughs> Justin, Justin Law. Justin Law, um, he painted a bad picture for us with the needles. And I told him, so I don't mind saying it on that camera either. I'd like you to try to find a community that has all these agencies picking up needles in the city. Here we go. DPW is picking up needles. Brewster Ambulance, picking up needles. Brockton Fire Department, picking up needles. Brockton Police, picking up needles. Brockton School Police, picking up needles. School personnel before children go into school are picking up needles. Needles aren't just in Brockton. They're out in LA, they're in Denver, they're everywhere. Ireland, needles. Portugal, Channel 25, do you see the special they did on how Portugal's handling the, handling the heroin, the heroin opidome, uh, opiate epidemic thank you anybody see that you, you can get you can get it on the on the um, on the computer take a look at it I went there for their presentation and they do say apples and oranges completely different apples and oranges our, our their drug problem was folks that graduated up our drug problem is doctors that were giving us pills dentists that were giving us our, the pills but the state's firmed up on that now when you go for a toothache and you get something cleaned, you're not getting 14 days worth of Percocets. Seven, five, whatever it might be. Or BI. Surgeries now, they'll give a Tylenol regional uh, regime of medications rather than narcotics. This is all good stuff. Prescription take back. We've held one here. We've held a few here. We have the green box at the station. You have any prescriptions that you don't want anymore, you can bring them to the station. I empty that box about every six weeks. And then we take it down to <clears throat> Covanta, Seamass, and West Wayham, and I watch them get burned. We also have a mobile box. The mobile box goes out to the high rises because we don't want folks putting all their medications in a bag, getting on a bus, taking a ride down to the station. They could become a victim. So we bring the box to you, to, to the high rises, and we, we fill those boxes up. Okay, now we can get to the homeless outreach. Homeless, like I said earlier, we're all one bad incident away from being homeless. How do we handle the homeless in Brockton? With compassion, dignity, and empowering. Um, if you take the time to actively listen to their story, actively engaged listening to their story, it becomes understanding. It could be mental illness, yes. It could be loss of a job. It could be a divorce. 
It could be death of somebody that they cared for where they checked out of society. There's so many different ways that someone chooses the homeless life. Others don't choose it, they're forced into it. Now, I was talking earlier with your council, councilwoman, and there was concerns for some homeless that are very close by here. Well, October 1st, those encampments are gonna be cleaned out. But understand that out of those encampments, there's three couples. One couple's moving, they're going to LA. He's got a support system out there that's waiting for him. Another couple, he was a carpenter. Uh, he lost his mode of transportation, his truck. Therefore, he lost his job. We're working with him to get him another job. And he doesn't want to leave this area because the service is here that he takes part of. The third group uh, couple I have not been able to make contact with. Uh, I've been out to their camp many times. Out of the three camps, theirs are, it's a disgrace. I don't know if they're still there. I don't know if they're locked up. I don't know if they're in treatment. Once I get to know who they really are, I can look into that. The other two camps are spotless. People stuck in their circumstances. So that it, again, the homeless, I'm the one that does the outreach. It's all about dignity. It's all about respect. And it's all about empowering them in the decision making that has to take place. Mainspring. Let's talk about Mainspring House. How does one land at Mainspring? other than being homeless. Released from a jail. And they can stay three days at Mainspring. But their origin is not Brockton. But they're released to Mainspring. Can you see how that's a drain on our services? Mm -hmm. We will take our share. We will fill our boat. But what do we do? How do we fix that? Once the service, they come and they, they stay at the mainspring for three days, I can honestly tell you that they're released and then they put a strain on our two ERs. They want a warm bed and food. Who doesn't want that? So they end up in our ERs and the staying in our ERs could be for days to weeks. We'll take our share, we'll fill our boat, but we need help from other, other agencies around here. The Haven. The Haven is at 74 Pleasant Street. It's open Monday and Wednesdays. The Haven is open to anybody that would like to go there. What does the Haven do? It'll invite anybody in, regardless of what condition that they're in. If they're intoxicated, they're still unwelcomed in. It's a safe place to be during the day on Mondays and Wednesdays. While they're there, there's counselors that will speak to them about GED, about hepatitis vaccines, getting insurance, finding employment, getting into treatment. But again, it's only open two days, two days a week. And it's right around the corner from Main Spring. So Main Spring should be a good funnel to it. And it's all about getting people back to work. So is there any questions on any of that? Just such a fabulous, comprehensive approach. Mm. Say that again. Thank you for informing us of this comprehensive approach to addressing the needs of our citizens. I had no idea where all these exist. That's why I'm so happy that I was invited here. The more that I did, the police department doesn't promote itself enough, it was we were never in the business to promote ourselves. But I think that all this work that's being done, you have an outstanding police department here. I'd compare them against anybody. Sorry, that's not a challenge out there, but I would compare them with, with any department. You have an outstanding department here. The police are the people, and the people are the police, and you read that stuff when you go and you're studying to make rank, but that's the truth, and if we don't get back to that, I think coming here and speaking, I know that there's folks in this room that will come up and approach me when they see me out on the street next. I know that the phone calls to the police might be a little bit different. And hopefully with the officer responding, they will go the same way. It's all about us communicating. Mm -hmm. I was asked earlier today, 
what are we going to do with this establishment that has the folks out there that stand in the parking lot and they're panhandling? And I, my response was, are they patrons? Did they purchase something at that establishment? Yes. Then go over and talk to management. Be an adult. Go talk to management and say, we're concerned for this. How can we work together to fix it? If we don't start working together, we're not going to get anything done. I have a question on the, um, on the, I don't need that, I'm very loud. Yeah, but he does. Oh, I'm sorry. So I have to do it. Sorry. I have a question, um, I have a question on the, um, on the homeless when you talk about Main, uh, Main uh, uh, Street Spring House. My church is on, uh, not that far from here, and on several occasions we feed the homeless, but um, lately, it's been more and more and more. Is that because you're overstaffed? I mean, I think when they let them out, um, well, particularly on Sunday morning, when they let them out, where do they go from there? Because they seem to come to our church and they're there. Like once, once they're out of church, they're hanging up in the back of the building. So uh, my question is, can they go back to Mainspring, or once they let them out, they have to stay out for a certain amount of time? Because you talk about. Um, your drug court, right? So how is that connected? How is how's the drug court in that connected? Yes, a lot of stuff there. All right. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is good. It's because I work with the uh, Brockton Interfaith called Bit. I've been yep. with them since 1990, and this is the type of work that I that I do <laughs> with them, volunteer. So I'm just trying to understand the whole situation. Yeah. Thank you. Main Spring does their intake. I believe it's around three or four o'clock and the folks can stay for the evening and then the next morning they they have to leave mm -hmm. but they can come back in at four it's i my understanding there's a three-day yes you can come here no <laughs> questions asked and then if there's room you can continue to come back uh dinner is served lunch is served breakfast is served but i'm glad that you're also feeding them too which is great drug court different thing. Somebody that's in a jail with 18 months over their head can partition the, uh, partition the court to be accepted as a drug court. And then they go through a detox, they go through phase one where they put into a, um, into a program where they stay at that program, they don't leave the door for the first quarter of their treatment. Next phase two, now they can leave but only to go to groups with another participant, outside groups. Third phase, obtain a job, continue going to groups. So th th there is a lot, they keep their day very busy. Fourth stage, show that you have a savings account. Uh, some go to a halfway house and they show that, yes, I can survive this way, and then by the end of the fourth stage, they're graduating and they're back into society. <laughs> Okay, um, when when the homeless leave the shelter at um, in the morning time, now they have once they get out of there, they have except for those two days, like you said, no place to go. They 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 can't go into any place. Especially, I've seen them freezing in the winter time and when it's snowing out and they're sleeping in places where they sh you know shouldn't be but they have no place to go isn't there some place that they can go during the daytime because that is one of the biggest problems that we find is with these people the, the, the homeless that they have no place to go other than that two days a week Oh, I've talked to a lot of them. During the cold season, the church at West Elm and Warren Ave. Is that part of Bick? It was. Yes, yeah, Central Night, but they moved on Pleasant Street. Yeah, but they still come connected. That pastor opens up the church during the cold. Main Spring, during the extreme cold, they stay open. Anybody can stay in the building during the extreme cold. Then there's a change. During the extreme cold, anybody that's barred from the Main Spring, can get into the main spring. And it's changed then. But what do we do for them? I'm putting it back on society. What do we do for the homeless population 
when it's freezing out, what can we do? Tough question. And it, a lot of folks, that's good, I'm glad to hear that. A lot of folks will go to the ER and sit in the waiting room. They don't want to be seen, but they're staying in the waiting room. We've had people sleeping in our lobby at the police department. They'll stay there. It's tough. Unless we embrace them, it's only going to get tougher. And again, homelessness? Is it a broken problem? Is it a state problem? Is it a nation problem? Or is it a world problem? It's a world problem. You don't like hearing that stuff though, right? It's kind of tough to hear. Put the burden on us. We're going to fix it. We have to fix it. Yeah. We're just country more. Yes, sir. How do you see the recreational marijuana industry negatively or positively affecting this? We could spend hours on end trying to answer that question. I'm not even, I'm not even going to scratch that. It, it's all different opinions. And it, that wouldn't be a police department opinion, it would be my personal opinion. And remember, I have a lot, I come from the medical side. <laughs> so, sorry. I have one more question. I want to address, <coughs> sorry. How do you see the difference between um, the drugs that are out there now than the, uh, the drugs that uh, I think it probably go back to the 1990s, the crack? Um, do, don't you think that people are still out there on that type of drug? I'm not being um, selfish, but I'm just trying to understand how that they are reaching out uh, to helping people now when so many people that I know have lost their lives. To uh, to the drug crack, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to figure out the difference between the you know between the two you know because you know they're so into this drug now but you know people and I know people still out there taking that drug so I'm just trying to figure out you know what's the difference. Sad to say, stand by for crack. It's coming back. Mm -hmm. Cocaine's coming back and it's coming back fast. Uh, the problem is now. Folks that believe they get cocaine, it's being laced with fentanyl. So they, they will swear that I only did coke, but Narcan's bringing them back. So it's, it's laced with the fentanyl. The epidemic with crack, yes, I worked in the 80s and 90s when crack was the drug of choice, but this opium epidemic that was caused not only by people selling narcotics on the street but by, the, by our medical staff funneling it into everybody just exploded but i'm just trying to figure out you don't think that crack was an epidemic you don't think that no but i'm just trying to figure out the you know the difference i mean i think i think it was a, we had a lot of death crack yeah, and we did mm -hmm. yeah. okay crack came so, crack so. went okay heroin came it stayed. Okay. It, it, it it's cheap. really locked in. It's okay. cheap. That's why it's cheap. Okay. It's cheap. Okay. Much cheaper. And the THC that was around in the 80s, it's much stronger now. Much stronger. Anyone else? Okay. I still got two hours left. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. That's all right. Thank you, Lieutenant Lenahan. We're a city with issues and concerns, but it's very reassuring to know that Barkton Police, like Lieutenant Lenahan and so many others there, are working on all these programs to help our less fortunate. I, I think we're really blessed. 
Now at this time, I want to acknowledge the wind beneath my wings are, are the other elected officials who help me answer my questions um, and show up at, at ward meetings. I'm going to tell you who's, who's come tonight and then I'm going to ask each one if they would like to have a moment to speak. So the state representatives who have attended this meeting this evening are Representative Jerry Cassidy and Representative Michelle Dubois. And then two counselors of law at large have joined us, Jean Bradley Darincourt, who's new like me, and Counselor Wynn Farwell. So, <laughs> Representative Cassidy, would you like to speak? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. This is uh, just like my home because every uh, fourth uh, Friday I come here and we have donuts up the back there, and I don't see Gladys up back there, but uh, I'm not the highest elected official here. Uh, Mary is, because she's the president of uh, the B building here. So Mary is in charge of this meeting. And uh, I just brought a couple things. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, Wayne, you're, you're in charge of the A building. Sometimes we have a little discussion between A and B, you know. Um, but uh, the, the ballot uh, coming up, the election this uh, year is uh, November 6th. The election. So I brought a few of the books from the state house the, on the questions uh, one, two, and three that are coming up. Um, and if everybody would like to uh, just read it and study it over, I'm not going to tell you how to vote because you're you're going to vote the way you want to. Uh, but Sue is uh, doing a great job here. He took over from some big shoes there. Paul Stadensky was uh, very good friends, and being a police officer, Paul was uh, uh, phenomenal here in the city of Brockton. So you're doing doing a great job. Um, so if anybody would like to come on Friday mornings, 9.30, right up the back there, and uh, thank you, Sue. Thank you, Jerry. And so, Councilor Farwell? Thank you very much. I'm Councilor Large Wynn Farwell. It's a pleasure to work with Sue. She and I share a lot of different public safety issues because, as many of you know, I retired from the Brockton Police Department. It was my pleasure to work with uh, Lieutenant Linehan when I was on the force. And I'm really glad he did what he did tonight because you can see how police work has evolved. We had one-tenth of what you just described back in the late 70s, 80s, and, and then it really started in the 1990s. But there's a misimpression about police work from television. It's it's not chase the bad guys, shoot it out, or put them in custody and take them to the jail. It's it's reaching out. It's making connections. It's trying to build a rapport with people so that they trust you to the extent they can and you trust them. So it was a real privilege to hear this. Um, I will be here if anyone has questions for, for me after Sue. And thank you very much for letting me be a part of this. Okay, so it's your turn. Who's got a question or concern that you'd like to share with the crowd? And I just ask you to come up here so that I can uh, have you speak into the microphone, or else I'll try to bring it to you. Who wants to go first? I'd like to have facial recognition with, like, you Wait, have a Turn around to the camera and hear Dead hold, person. Hold this I don't want to hold it, it, but. <laughs> But like if you um like say you got dead people and you got people walking right by you, it could be your family member that walked by and you have facial recognition and you know what what you got the street lights that could say oh they go Billy and then they could have the cruiser go pick them up bring them home that way you ain't out sleeping and freezing to death outside or they can help them go to the next step so even if he was in prison they can help them to get on um housing to get an apartment and then they're not sleeping on freezing to death feel like they're dying because they don't have nothing and they're stealing from their friends to make it to the next day and they're stealing like he went out and bought a loaf of bread and you're stealing it just to make eat sandwiches and junk and then you're stealing from your own friends that don't have nothing weren't you going to weren't you going to make a comment about the buses and and a, a crosswalk Look at, look at the camera and tell us about that. You're I like to have the buses slow down in, in um, the B building, no, A building, because they come around so fast. And then I like to have a crosswalk go from the A over to the, 
over to the park so the homeless and the deaf people can hear because they whip around so fast and you don't even know they're coming and then and then you and they don't even you, if they have a crosswalk there you have enough time to get on the bus to go and catch to go shopping and grocery shopping and come back and the way it is now you can't really do it. you gotta run to get on it and then they might leave you and then you don't even get to get food to get back and everything so it's just like you being homeless you can't do nothing okay. thank you so much thank have you. a great day thank you very much else come on don't be shy okay Tom let me see if it'll it'll reach because okay. way I handshake um, two things I want to thank you first of all for rectifying the problem we have with the auto place up here parking on the street making it very difficult for people like me in a wheelchair for people on walkers, you'd have to walk onto the street, and you were very responsive to that, and I thank you 1,000%. You did a great job on that. And the other is to follow up on our little pet project we're going with the cross crossing light between Main Street and hopefully Plain Street, because the way they whip up and down the street here. And I just want a little, you know, let the people know what's going on with that. And that's it. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Tom gets in touch with me occasionally. He he. Um, since I'm elected, he is interested in a crosswalk um, that will protect him and others like him in a wheelchair or or you know partially disabled um, when when they're crossing. Tom was hit by a car a few months ago as he was coming out of the CVS parking lot on at the corner of Main and Keith well, Avenue. Well, actually happened right here across from the self-help. Self okay. The woman was coming out the wrong way. Okay. On his cell phone, there's another one. Right. Oh, and, yeah. and also, in the wintertime, when he goes on a little excursion up to the CVS, he comes out the Plain Street um, exit here and turns onto Plain Street, and there is no sidewalk for him to travel on either it's not the snow is there it's not plowed or else some of the auto repair places have been piling their cars on the sidewalk yeah. so it's a continuing problem it comes up we the police address it for us and then it comes back to us again we just have to keep working on it that was that day yes yes and it's good that you were there to talk to them right. yes mm -hmm. thank you Tom thank you so much somebody else come on Word four, we got issues. <laughs> thank you. Hi. First of all, I want to thank you for that information. It was, yeah. it was pretty amazing, uh, all these programs that exist in the city. I've lived in Barkton for 20 years. <clears throat> uh, prior to that, I lived in Boston for 20 years. One of the concerns I have, for 17 years, I lived at Fairway Oaks, and that was considered private property. and. I was told we never saw any police um, because it was supposedly private property. I now live off of Copeland Street, and I've lived there for three years. Um, and I hope you don't take this personally, but I have never seen a police car come down my street or very, very seldom on Copeland Street. Uh, I'm wondering why there isn't. When I lived in the city, I saw more foot police and police cruisers going into the neighborhoods. I don't see it here. Thank you for your question. Fairway Oaks has a lot of police that live there. So, are you sure? I have yeah. a neighbor around schedule. I'm not going to check. <laughs> uh, Copeland Street, I used to live off of Copeland. So maybe that was me going back and forth all the time. I'm not making fun of it. I'm just trying to make a little bit light of it. The you, your police department in this city are going call to call to call to call. So on the proactive side, I was laid off in 1991. When I came back, I had to walk a beat on your feet with another officer. 
in the five areas that the federal government said were the highest crime. It was the best thing I did other than what I'm doing now. We got out to meet the community. When the community knew we were there to stay, they started sharing all kinds of stuff with us. That's what we need. Yeah. We need police back in the, on their feet, walking in neighborhoods, meeting and greeting, and getting to know the people. It's call volume. It's call volume. If you get a scanner, you hear it, it's constant. Neighboring communities listen to our scanner. Neighboring communities don't have the call volume. They're entertained by the Brockton call volume. It's just, it's just call volume. And hopefully, with the officers just came on, and I know there's talk of another 15 coming on, there'll be more people out in the street. Good. Yeah. Win anything on that? You could easily use 30 or 40 more people. Yeah. That's the bottom line. And they would be put to work. If we had 30 or 40 more, they would be put to work. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. Bye. And before I ask for another question, I should tell you, I spoke with um, State Senator Michael Brady today, and he didn't think he was going to be here this evening. He had two other commitments. Um, but he sends you his very best. He's very responsive. Nobody has a better customer service team um, among the State Senate, I believe. And, and uh, Keep them in your thoughts. Somebody else with a question. Rosemary. No, I was going to say about the police. They don't come on from lockdown. They don't. The police don't come on, on <coughs> in precinct right. day. Okay. And I know there's a house on that street. Cars are coming and going constantly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I have reported it each time I've talked to you. I have forwarded on. I reported Grove Avenue as well. Um, in Grove Street. Well, one on Grove Ave got caught. Yes, it was in the paper the other night. Good. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I still asked them to continue the patrols. Oh, yeah. And the message I got back yesterday was they would. They would. Someone else have, have something? Okay. Like, there's not enough sidewalks. There's not enough sidewalks. You're coming from, you're coming from Walmart, walking down to go to where you can catch the bus. There's no, there's no sidewalks. Even if there was a dirt sidewalk where you got grass or anything, you got to have something to get on so the cars don't run you over. Sure. So you can just keep going and keep going on your own way instead of just standing there waiting for the bus to come. It might take days or hours. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, right after I was sworn in, we received word, all of the word councils, that we would be able to have one street paved in each of our wards. And so I put in to have a street paved that I had learned about when I was running for office. Since then, my list of other streets people have contacted me about that need paving, I think it's up to nine or 10. If there is a street that you'd like to have paved, call me, 508-941-0108, and I will add you to the list, okay? Um, someone else have a, have a comment? Behind you. Dennis. <laughs> First, I want to say, Susan's doing a great job. Uh, recently, in front of the city council, she proposed something called noise boxes for the police department to get. We have all had problems with the wild, crazy parties. There's, and, and now the police are going to have something that they didn't have access to before, noise boxes. So if they get called to a party and the noise is beyond what's pro proper or legal, they can disperse the party, okay? I know we've all been having problems with these late night parties, but there's supposed to be a city ordinance in that they're supposed to get a permit at city hall, pay the fee, and also they're supposed to have, if it's gonna have more than 100 people, they're supposed to have a detailed police officer there. I'm hoping in the future our city council really pushes that and promotes that. And that's gonna be very, very important. Also, if you look at the size of the city, we are exactly 25 police officers shot in the department for a city this size. Recently, you've seen a lot of police on bicycles. Thank goodness. I think that's a great idea. Recently, you've seen people, finally, these police officers walk in the beat again, which is excellent, too. I, I think our police are doing a good job. I know there's frustration because sometimes you get calls in 
one thing I don't understand about the police department, that 4 p.m. to midnight shift, there is not enough police officers on that. Well, July 4th, you only had 13 cops on a, on a July 4th night, which is ridiculous. It should have been 20 on and at least nine cars. But overall, I don't blame that on the police. Blame that on who's scheduling the police. And please realize that there are 25 police officers shot for a city this size. That's the exact number they shot. Also, I want to point out, uh, in July, there was an advertisement for a really big party down on South Layden Street. If it hadn't been for Susan, that, that could have erupted into another situation that they had two years ago up on Myrtle Street with a murder. Mm -hmm. The lady who had the party was selling liquor illegally. She was charging admission, selling food, which is totally illegal. I don't know why, she, until to this day, I don't know why she wasn't arrested, okay? But uh, Susan put a stop to that party, and we could have had a total catastrophe down there on South Layden Street. So if you do hear wild, crazy parties, okay, first call should go to the police. If they don't respond, then you have to call your city councilor. Susan does act upon these things. She really does. And, I, and my hat's off to her with a lot of respect. And my hat's off to the police department with a lot of respect, too being 25 police officers shot for a city this size, they're doing an amazing job. The only criticism I have is that 4 p.m. to midnight shift. They really, we really need more police officers on that shift because it's, it's a dangerous, dangerous shift. Thank you, Susan. And I just wanted to say, as to that 88 South Layton Street wild party, I think it was called Wild Water Wars 2018. Um, it was because I was tipped off by several residents um, that this was happening. They were they noticed there were preparations for this wild party, and that and so I was able to forward that information to the police, and they took appropriate action. So if you see something happening call me, 508-941-0108. Um, I will get the ball rolling. It's very important to our quality of life. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I've been addressing the most here in Ward 4, quality of life issues. Somebody else have, an, have a concern, a comment? No, you got to. Okay, you got to. Let's give somebody else a chance, okay? Dennis, I've known you for a long time, and I, yes, we'll take 25. <laughs> but I do have to say this. I have to clarify one thing, and I know he didn't mean it the way that he said it. Brockton police respond to every call that comes in. Every call does get answered. Every call. It goes on a queue, it stays on that board, and it doesn't get cleared out until the officer responds to that call. So if you make the call, we will respond. Okay? <laughs> But we do have to prioritize, but we yes. will be there. I have a large family. I might have a christening at my house. There may be 100 people coming there. I don't have to get a permit. But for these, I forget what you call that, what and wild? If you're selling tickets. That one. <laughs> if you're selling tickets and you're going to have food trucks, didn't we? Didn't the city change that now? It goes before a, a committee and has to be 30 days ahead of time now? It's supposed to go in front yeah. of license, but if they don't go to license, then, yeah, then they're in violation. Anyway. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we can work together on that one. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. And, and just so you all know, on the issue of noise, um, because noise uh, complaints were very prevalent this summer in Ward 4. I am working on a new noise ordinance. I'm hoping to get something together in the next month to submit to the ordinance committee. Um, and speaking of the ordinance committee, I'd like Councillor Farwell to just tell you what we have coming up. The forum and the oh, next yeah. ordinance committee meeting. Oh. All right? Yeah. I'm just... I'm just getting over a uh, ruptured Achilles tendon, so I wasn't spending all afternoon at the Cape Cod Cafe. That's not why I'm a little unsteady on my feet here. <laughs> promise, promise. That's the truth. Uh, coming up in the Ordinance Committee, uh, that will be meeting uh, October 18th at 6 o'clock at the Little Theater at Brockton High School. Uh, on October 4th, which is a Thursday, we will have the second and final 
open forum for residents to be able to come in and talk about where they'd like marijuana retail shops located, what business regulations they might favor, what zoning issues they'd like us to tackle. Um, the ordinance committee has been busy, uh, but we hope to get these regulations finalized in October so they can go back to the full committee, get voted in, and get things rolling. Um, I don't know if I've left anything out, anything that you can think of? I think you hit it on. Okay. Thank you. I do have one correction, though, when you meant the wind beneath your wings. Your husband is in the back of the room. I hope we're going to include him in that, so. Oh, that's right. Okay. Right. He is the wind, big wind beneath my wings, absolutely. He's my sugar daddy. Uh, uh -oh. um, this information that, that uh, State Rep Cassidy brought is excellent. There are three questions on the ballot in November. You should educate yourselves on it by reading this information and also through the magic of the internet you can obtain some good information. I would like, to, it looks like our time for questions is ending and so I would like to end by saying it's so important. Yes, Tom? Can I just make one comment? Yes, can I just bring the, yes. the microphone to you? I'd like to thank Susan because I've lived in these both these buildings for almost 25 years and this is the first time in those 25 years, it's a quarter of a century people, that we have had a ward council meeting here. You know, I'm very disappointed there wasn't more people here because a lot of issues like mobility, like myself, but I want to thank Susan personally for all the residents here that you will finally included us because sometimes we feel like we loved them. So thank you very much. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. And and I just like to say, the uh, the king of the the building A Tenant Association Wayne is here tonight, and he's been very kind to me since I've taken this job. And the queen of the building B Tenant Association Mary Princiata is here tonight as well. She's been very good to me, um, and I'm very grateful. Um, so what I was thank you, Tom. That nice words. Thank you. What I wanted to say to you is. You don't, you don't have the radio or the television on 10 minutes that you don't, you're not impacted by and moved and swayed by what's going on in Washington or what's going on in Boston. It's so crucial that you vote. You know, people say to me, it doesn't matter. Oh yeah, it matters, it really matters. I wanna urge all of you here tonight and all of you watching hereafter, vote, please vote in November. Um, educate yourself about the candidates and about the questions, please vote. It is our right, but it's also our obligation to vote. So unless anybody has anything else, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you, so, oh, thank you so much. And I should tell you as a PS, Councillor Beauregard's been to several meetings this evening and she's just come in, our Ward 5 Councillor, and I'd like to give her a moment just to say something. She is our, Hardest working counselor. She attends more meetings per week than anyone. Here. Hi. Well, thank you. Yes, I mean I paid her to do that. No. Um, <laughs> no, actually, I was at a couple meetings here, and one of them saw parking authority. The other one was on a proposal to um, enhance downtown further. But um, two things. First of all, on October third. I'm having my Ward 5 meeting, and for some of you that have your own homes and have older homes, there's uh, grants out available to address your um, lead paint situation, because in New England, and particularly in Massachusetts, we have an awful lot of older homes with the lead paint situation. It's rather costly, apparently, to remove it. So somebody will be there for that. Also, somebody will be explaining an awful lot about the various uh, documents that you need, or should you want to, you know, expand your business, change your business, other, you know, types of um, documents you might need as an individual, you know, changes you want to make, etc. At uh, City Hall, and she'll be there to explain things. Plus, some other elected officials will come and uh, be able to speak to if you have any other questions. And also, I've been asked by um, this is uh, next Wednesday, October third, the Broughton Main Library from seven to eight thirty. And uh, we're going to be in the Driscoll Galleries, plenty of parking at the, uh, I'm sorry, the lot on White Ave. 
The other thing I don't want to forget to tell you is uh, Broad Change Faith Community the following week is addressing the issue of the underfunding of our public schools in the city of Brockton. And uh, that's going to be actually right diagonally across the street at uh, the Trinity Baptist Church. And it starts around 6.30ish. And anyone's welcome to come to that and uh, address the issues and understand all the, um, how I say, uh, the in intricacies of uh, funding the fourth largest school system in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for being here and good night.